Hello. Good morning, church. Morning, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see you. Particular warm welcome out if you're new. Um, just to say, we're going to start in about 30 seconds. Um, there are loads of seats at the front, uh, some of them in the sunshine, but what a great place to be on a Sunday morning. Um, so do come and fill up from the front. Um, that'll be great. Try not to sit at the back if you can help it. Come and sit at the front um, and we'll get going in a few, a few seconds. Good, good stuff, good stuff. Well, it, it's great to see you here this morning. Uh, if we've not met before, my name's Jack. I'm part of the church family here at Broadmead Baptist Church. Um, I'm going to be leading us through the next kind of hour and a quarter um, with our time together this morning. Um, you might be new to church if you are a particular warm welcome. Uh, you might be thinking, what on earth is, what on earth are these guys all about? This might be your, your first time even in a church building. Um, but we are a, a family of, of Christians. We're a family of broken people who love Jesus. Um, and we want to see his name known in, in, in Bristol. Um, and so we meet here this morning to worship God together, um, to sing praise to him, to speak with him, and to hear from him as well. Um, and we're going to do that as, as John comes and preaches to us. Um, there are a few things happening in the life of the church. They would just have been on your, uh, they'd have been up on the screen, kind of circulating around. Um, so please do take notes of, uh, of those. We've got a church members meeting on, on Tuesday. So if you're a member of the church, um, please do come along to that. That's here. 7.30 p.m. Uh, well, it's actually upstairs. Um, yeah, that's really important just in terms of, uh, yeah, understanding and voting in terms of stuff that's going on in the life of the church as well. And I know Johnny Staplehurst has been working very hard in the background to get numbers ready for that as well. So, yeah, please do, please do come along for that. Um, as we come to our, our time of worship this morning, um, I don't know what your week's been like. I don't know what kind of state of mind you're in coming here this morning. Maybe uh, nerves. It's the final day of the Premier League season. Seen a, an Arsenal shirt uh, already this morning. Um, you can live in faith, but let's be real. Uh, Man City are probably going to win the league. Um, but, but sort of joking aside, p- people will be here this morning with lots of different things that have happened in their week. Things that are good. Things that are, things that are bad. And actually, as we, as we come this morning to worship God together, I wanted just to, to invite us just to spend a, f- a few moments in quiet, just to prepare our hearts to, to meet with God. And we believe that he's here and he wants to speak with each and every one of us. We believe that you're here uh, for, for a reason, that God's ordained that, that you're here this morning. Um, so if you just join me, why don't we just spend just a, a couple of seconds, just with our eyes closed um, and our heads bowed. Um, and maybe let's just spend a bit of time in our hearts, just thanking God for our weeks, the good things that have happened, but also coming before him as, as broken people um, and confessing the, the times when we've rejected him, where we've ignored him, where we've not honored him in the things that we've said, the things that we've thought and the things that we've done. So let's just say just a few moments just to prepare our hearts before the Lord. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's our promise from our King, that he will walk beside us, he will go before us, uh, and his love and his mercy will be with us 
all the days of our lives, in all circumstances. Um, so we're going to sing praise to God for that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm just going to invite you to stand um, and we're going to sing together. So let's stand. Strong to 
the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. And I believe. so much, Lord, that, Lord, you did conquer the grave, Lord, that you, uh, yeah, defeated sin on that cross for us, Lord, and that, and that changes everything for us, changes our view on life, Lord, it changes our circumstances, we are free to live in relationship with you, and so, Lord, we, we thank you for that, we praise you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good stuff. Um, young people, uh, you're not going to go out? Heads up, Noah, heads up. Uh, everyone take a seat, take a seat. Uh, could all the young people, so let's say like, I don't know, three, two to 14, two to 14, is that all right? Can you come to the front, just here, is that all right? So two to 14, anyone under than two, going to get a little bit messy. So two to 14, there's a lot of, there's a lot of 11 to 14 year olds at the back there. Come on, come on down. So come, come and stand here. Hello, 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 hello. Good, cool. Um, what, what I'd like us, is this on? How's that? That's better. Cool. W what I'd love us to do would be, if we can, to split into two teams. Can we do that? Can we split into two teams? So should we go? Oh, it's just all the young people. Let's if I don't know if you. Oh, let's just split, young and old. Right down the middle, right there. All right, we go. You guys go that way. You guys go that way. Now, do you want to be team blue or team orange? Team blue. Okay. Even wearing a Bristol City fan, he likes blue. Bristol Ravers. Right, there we go. Orange, orange, too late. There's it, there you go. Right. Uh, and then that leaves team orange over here. Thank you, thank you. Nice Arsenal shirt. Unlucky. Um, right. What I'd, what I'd love us to do, what I'd love us to do, um, and, and adults, you're not exempt from this. So what we're going to do is we're going to split down the middle. Um, let's go this side here. Uh, this side, you're going to be supporting Team Orange. Is that all right? Okay, Team Orange. A ripple, a ripple. Uh, this side and the seven people on the balcony, you're Team Blue. Can I give us just a quick cheer? There we go. There we go. Quite something. So what, what I'd like us to do, and I might, I might need parents' help for this, um, what, what we're going to do is a relay race, okay, with the ball. So what I'd like us to do is to create two lines going from over in that corner, and we're going to have to snake all the way around to just 
somewhere on the carpet over there. Is that all right? So we split into... So, oh, this is going to be confusing. They haven't understood what I've said. Right. Um, so if you guys can basically form a long line, Daniel, if you can help them form a long line all over that way with a bit of a gap between everyone. So someone start here, someone start here. And then Team Orange, if you can do that as well, you're all a bit older, so it should be pretty easy, I hope. So make a long line. Keep going. Snake all the way around this way, all around this way. We're doing a relay race. You're going to have to pass the ball to each other all along this. Team Orange, if you can do the same, if you can go next to them, we're going to have a race to see who can, who can move the ball the quickest. Nice and quickly. So if you, head, if you guys head all the way and snake all the way around there, have a bit of a gap between you. So spread out, spread out, spread out, spread out. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Thanks, Steve. Next up, keep spreading out. Keep go, 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 go. Go if you just spread all the way along there, all the way along there. And then a wrap that way, that way, that way. Yeah, yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going. Mark Wallace, point them, point them on, point them on, encourage them as they go past. So stay about there. So you want about a meter and a half between each of them. Okay. You have to run and pass it to each other. Cool. Bit of a line. So what team are you in? Orange, right, so you're there. Team Orange, you're there. Team Orange, you're there. Do you go there? You go there? What are you, team? Oh, sorry, team blue. There you go. You go right next to there. And stop there, stop there. So you want about a meter, meter and a half between you. Bit further back, bit further back, bit further back. Let's just go with it. Best laid plans and all that. Right, so kids and young people, what, what we're doing, obviously you'll be going out to your own groups in a minute, um, but what we're doing in church is looking at a letter that a guy, called, a guy called Paul wrote to a church in Rome. Rome is in Italy. If you like pizza, that's where pizza came from. Do I let Rome of the football club? Oh, give and take, give and take. Um, so what, and what we're doing is we're looking at a particular passage this morning um, that where Paul explains that if we trust in Jesus, then we are saved from our sin. It, it's not about working hard. It's not about trying our best and doing all that we can. It is purely and utterly about trusting in Jesus. And if we do that, we are saved. And that is good news. Now, I don't know if anyone here has had good news recently, um, but when we have good news, we love to share good news, don't we? So, for example, Plymouth Argyle recently stayed up in the championship. They didn't get relegated, and that was good news. Um, there you go, one fan in the room. And so, that's the good news that I want to share with people. And, and on your balls here, we have good news. Um, it's a bit dodgy because the they're quite hard to stick stuff to. But there's a good new, bit of good news on there. And what we're going to do is we're going to see who can pass the good news as much as we can, to, as quick as we can to the end. And I'm going to go over the microphone. And it's the first person to shout out that good news will win. Sounds a bit complex, doesn't it? But we'll see how we go. Right, ready? And, and, and adults, I want you to cheer and scream for your team, all right? So three, two, one, go. As quick as you can, quick as you can. Team Orange, and what, what does the good news say? Um, <laughs> the one that put on the name of the Lord. Oh, Team Orange are the winners, but also Team Blue got there. Well done, well done. Um, and, and the good news that we were passing around says everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we'll look at that in a minute uh, in terms of what that means for us as adults, but I'm sure you'll probably do that as well. And the fact that we want to pass that good news on as well. So can we have a round of applause to the kids and the young people? And then they're going to head off as well to their groups. Yeah, well done. Team Orange, big up. Uh, they'll head off to their groups. And while, while they're doing that, why don't you chat to the person next to you um, just briefly. Just give them a, a quick headline and a highlight of, of your week. Um, go from that.
amazing. Uh, gr- great stuff. Do you um do you carry on? Do you carry on those uh, those conversations after uh, after church over a coffee? Um, as we come to a time where we're going to pray to God and we're going to hear from Him as John comes in and preaches to us, um, we're going to sing a song just to kind of prepare our hearts for that. Um, and the song is called "Lord, I Need You." Um, and actually, it's, it's a song of surrender to God to to come before Him and to say, "Lord, we we need You. We can't do anything without You." Uh, come, Lord Jesus, speak to us. Um, so why don't we stand uh, and we'll sing that together. Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Grace is more where grace is found, is where you are, where you are, Lord. I am free, and holiness is Christ in me, Lord. I need you, Lord. say to you, Lord, we we need you. Lord, every hour we need you. And right now, Lord, we invite you to come by your spirit. Lord, be softening our hearts to to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Uh, And be with John, Lord, as he comes and preaches to us. Lord, may we just have receptive hearts and ears and and minds to hear what you are saying to us through this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So please uh, take your seats. Um, Alvin is going to come uh, and lead us in a time of prayer this morning. Thanks, Alvin. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning we may gather here to worship you. We pray for the church leadership, deacons, and ministry workers that's grace for service by multiples. May you bless them, have good health and wisdom from you. 
Dear Lord, we thank you that we have a two-year Bible reading plan. May you bless us. We will be inspired as we search the scriptures collectively. We pray for the coming Tuesday church members meeting. That's God. We're present in our discussions and decision makings. We pray for Peter and Louis Litchi. That's the Lord. We will prosper their work in Bangladesh. May the Spirit go with them always. Let your gospels preached all over the region. We pray for Dara that the therapy sessions will lead to a permanent healing. We pray for Ukraine, Israel, and Sudan. May your will appear in these countries, that the people have peace and provision for their daily life. We pray for the preaching of the word that our hearts will be opened to receive. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Let's say God's prayer. Hallows be your name. stuff we are going to um yeah turn to our bible reading this morning um as alvin was saying there we are reading through the bible together in two years uh, at the moment and we are currently in uh, one samuel uh, and we're in the book of romans as well and as i said earlier we're, we're going to be diving into the book of romans together so if you want to turn your um bibles to romans chapter 10 if you've got a blue or, or red bible that's a pew bible that's page 1137 it's on the screen as well um but do grab that up uh, on your phone Bibles as well. Romans chapter 10. Um, I will read, I'll read the whole chapter and then John's going to preach to us. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they must, if they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call in the one whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all in the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard uh, through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will, make you, I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Let me pray for John as he, as he comes and preaches to us. 
Um, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the prep that John has done uh, in yeah, unpacking uh, and yeah, preparing the talk this first morning. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would be here by your spirit, Lord, you'd be speaking through John. Lord, that he would be sensitive to what it is you, you're putting on his heart uh, for us this morning. And give us open hearts, open minds, attentive spirits, Lord, to hear what you're saying to us. And we pray, Lord, that yeah, in all of this, we would be changed for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Jack. Great. Um, so, as has already been said, we're going through the Bible in two years, and we've got to Romans, um, and we've got to Romans 10. And Romans is this blockbuster book, in it? Paul is introducing himself to this church he's never been to, and he's kind of saying, this is what I'm about. And he needs to do that, partly because there's loads of people who want to kill him. So he's kind of saying, I want to visit you, but I also don't want you to kill me. Um, so um, this is what I'm about. This is my gospel, he calls it, in chapter 1. Um, and a big feature of that is this contrast between faith and works. Um, so that's a big feature of the whole of the book of Romans. Another big feature is kind of relationship between two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. And the passage we're looking at touches on both those things. So we're going to, it's kind of going to touch on some of the big issues of Romans. Um, and it's going to land where Paul lands. He kind of finishes the whole book talking about how he wants to travel. Um, and not in the sense he wants to see the world and get a nice tan. He wants to travel because he wants to share with more people this news. That's what he's about. And he's sharing his plans to come to them and then to move on. He's a man on the move. And again, this has a really clear articulation of that for us. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and we're going to look at verses 9 to 15 particularly. Um, and I don't know, if you might be here and you might be a Christian, many of us are, but you might not be a Christian, this might be fairly new to you. Uh, and it's easy, looking at Christianity from the outside, to think of it as a set of rules, maybe, or maybe a set of beliefs. But Christianity is fundamentally news. It's news about a person, and it's an invitation to, to be in relationship with that person, Jesus Christ. And the news is that Jesus saves that we need saving and that Jesus saves us. And there are all sorts of different ways that the Bible describes that saving, from alienation to reconciliation, um, from spiritual death to spiritual life, from slavery to freedom, from guilt to pardon. And here, Paul mentions in verse 11, that anyone who believes in Jesus will never be put to shame. So we're going to think about shame. Now, this isn't the only thing that Jesus does, um, and it's talking about it here because it's what's mentioned. Shame to dignity. And shame is, is, a, is a funny emotion. It, it relates to us and the way we deal with other people. If you experience shame, it's that feeling of not wanting to be seen of being aware of yourself or the way that you're seen and thinking, oh man, I wish that I could just hide away right now. And it's a funny thing. It's odd. Because you can feel shame about things that you are responsible for, but you can also feel shame about things that, that are not your decision or your choice, that aren't your responsibility in lots of ways. So that first example, you can feel shame for things that you've done. Um, one of my earliest experiences of shame is well, one, one of the clearest ones I can remember. I was doing Duke of Edinburgh. Did anyone do Duke of Edinburgh? Yeah? It basically involves walking around as a teenager. Um, and, and I thought I was quite good at maps, and you've got a team, and everyone has a different job on the team. And I, and I, was, I backed myself as a map person. So I was like, yeah, I'll plan the route. Um, so I planned the route. I did it at home on a computer. And these weren't people that I knew that well. They were, they were friends, but I was kind of like trying to prove myself a bit by designing maps. How tragic is that? Um, but uh, I, was, I planned the route, and I was like, yes, I've got the route. Um, and then I was going to print it off at home. And then I, I went to the printer, and I accidentally erased the whole file. Um, and so I, I turned up and had to explain to these people I didn't know that well that I, I'd completely failed. 
And, and that feeling was a feeling of shame, right? I had failed in a quite simple task, to be honest. Map reading isn't that hard. Um, and they saw that I'd failed, and that failure had let everyone down. I'd, I'd screwed up. And there was a feeling of shame. That's quite trivial. But, and I was responsible for it. But shame can be really serious. And it can be for stuff that we're not responsible for. So people talk about AI as some distant, far-off kind of nightmare future where robots take over. But actually, horrible stuff with AI is already happening. Now, AI has great opportunities as well. Don't read this as me just slagging off AI. Um, but one of the big problems that's current with AI is deep fakes. I'm sure you've come across that. For those who haven't, the idea is that someone's, there can be a video made of you doing something that you haven't done. And actually, the most common use of deep fakes is to generate pornographic material. And it's targeted at women. Now, that is horrendous. And if that happens to a person, and people they know see that, that will generate a feelings of shame. But they haven't done anything wrong. Literally nothing. They've just been targeted. Now, I've gone from a quite trivial example to a really dark one. But can you see, shame is complicated. And that feeling of hiding away, wanting, wanting to, to be covered, to be protected from this feeling of, of, of being exposed, is a lot about the audience. And with the internet, there's a, there's a global audience kind of ready all the time. So at any moment, something you do that you don't want to be seen can be shared, uh, captured and shared with all the people that you know. Shame is real and it's, and it's horrible. So we can feel shame for things we are responsible for. We can feel shame for things we're not responsible for. Um, and we can also feel shame that we shouldn't feel. So I was a teacher, and sometimes kids, um, lots of kids didn't really care about how they did, but some kids really, really cared too much about how they did in the school. And they would tie their whole sense of self and worth with how well they did in the latest test. And, and they would feel intense shame if they didn't do as well as they thought they did. And there'd be kids who were lovely kids who tried their hardest and actually did as well as they could possibly have done, but they just weren't particularly clever or good at the subject. And they'd feel this kind of, Shame, and they shouldn't have felt shame. But also, there are some things that people should feel ashamed for. So, I think of the, the post office scandal. I've mentioned this last time a few times I've preached. It's really got in my head. Um, but the post office scandal, again, I, I don't know if you've um, heard of this. Just quick reference, who's heard of it? Yeah, everyone who's here last time I preached. <laughs> Shut up, John. Uh, <laughs> Find another scandal. Um, so that <laughs> for those who haven't, the post office scandal, basically these people um, had done nothing wrong and there was a computer glitch and they got prosecuted because the computer was wrong. But no one, no one said that the computer was wrong. So they got in loads of trouble. Um, and then the people who did all that just covered it up for ages. Um, and they got away with it. And actually, the response to a TV program about it was to say, this is wrong, this is shameful. Something needs to change. And part of the reason that that happened, that it lasted as long as it did, was because the people who were in charge didn't feel shame when they should have. They should have been ashamed to do that. They should have been ashamed to, to cover up and, and lie and say, oh yeah, the computer system's fine, when they knew that it wasn't and they knew that people's lives were being ruined because it wasn't. So, shame's complicated is basically what I'm saying. And Paul is aware of those kind of complicated levels of shame, but he's particularly got in view a, a particular kind of shame that we can be saved from. Paul is aware of this moment at the end of all time when there will be justice. Now, justice is something we desperately need. You just look at the post office scandal. We need things to be set right. And Paul's anticipating this day when all will be seen, when things that are hidden in the darkness will be brought to light, that we've seen 
and they'll be publicly seen. They'll be seen by God. And there'll be an openness about that. And I said earlier, how we feel about something we're ashamed of depends on who knows about it, I think, doesn't it? Part of shame is this feeling that oh, people know. God knows everything that we've ever done. He sees it all. And there's going to come a time when that will be laid out. And God's opinion is not trivial. God's opinion matters deeply. It matters more than anyone else's opinion. God made everything. He determines value. He is. He's glorious. He's good. And, and he knows. And the Bible says that God cannot dwell in the presence of sin. Part of the mechanic of shame is that it, it excludes and it alienates. And yes, there are differing levels of shame we're not responsible for. And God knows that. But if we're honest, we can all think of things that we're ashamed of in our past that actually we are responsible for. And that kind of shame is existential. It matters because God sees and God knows and there will come a day when it's all revealed. So what do we do with this? How do we respond? Well, one way is to, is to kind of say, okay, right, I'm going to front up and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make myself as good as I can. I'm going to, I'm going to cover it up, I'm going to deny it, or um, I'm going to do something better. I'm going to distract. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to produce something amazing. Uh, and actually, I was reading about this, and narcissism, I don't know if you know what narcissism is, it's, it's kind of an excessive sense of self-regard, feeling like you're the center of the universe, basically. But actually, one of the, the things that makes people more likely to be narcissists is a sense of shame, actually. Narcissism, being self-obsessed, thinking that it's all about you, boasting and loving yourself above everything in a really unhealthy way, often comes from a sense of shame, trying to cover up, trying to make good for this sense that actually things aren't right, and you're ashamed of how you are. We can reach up and, and try and outperform our shame. Also, we can reach down in ourselves and... Shame can lead to feelings of worthlessness, feelings of despair. And some people will deal with shame by, by saying, well, I, I'm not worth anything, but, so I'll put myself in positions that are degrading. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be shameful, I'll be shameful. And both of those are things that we see, I think. Shame is a real problem. Which is why this message that Paul says is such good news. He says in verse 11, anyone who believes in Jesus will never be put to shame. Anyone who believes in Jesus will never be put to shame. How does this work? How, how can somebody who came 2,000 years ago deal with something that's so relevant, so practical, so, so painful, so present to us? It's because of what Jesus did. He came to earth and he endured shame. He endured shame that he didn't deserve and he endured that shame with us. But well, there's different kinds of shame, aren't there? Some shame is kind of imposed on us from outside. The kind of sh shame of experiencing something shameful. You haven't done anything wrong, but you feel like you don't want anyone to know about it. Jesus experienced that kind of shame. He experienced that shame with us. He was a victim of injustice, of oppression, of abuse. He was tortured. He was dehumanized. He was bullied.
But he didn't just ensure, endure shame with us, he endured shame for us. Because there are shameful things that we have done, that we have said, that we have thought. We know that, if we're honest with ourselves. Jesus came and he very deliberately took our shame on himself. He took the credit, the debit, if you like, actually, for the shameful things that we have done. And he gave us, in return, his unblemished record. Jesus' life and death deals with our shame. Because what happens is, God sees, right? He, he knows, and he sees everything. He sees into parts of our life that no one else sees into, parts of your mind, things you've done, things you've said, things you've thought. And he sees that. And he knows that. And Jesus Christ took those darkest things, the unimaginable things, the things you don't want anyone to know about, that they don't know about maybe, and, and he took them on himself. And when God looks at Jesus, he sees what you have done, the dark things that you don't want anyone to know that people don't know about. And when he looks at you, he sees what Jesus Christ has done, who Jesus Christ is, his goodness, his love. God sees us at our worst. And he loves us because of Jesus Christ. And it's not just that God can hold his nose and be like, oh yeah, you've done this terrible thing, but I can deal with that. I've kind of, I'm over it now. No, he absolutely loves to do this. He loves to take people who are broken, who are at the end of their tether, who, who, are, who are hiding in a corner, cowering, who don't want to be seen, and say, welcome. There's a way for you to be in my presence because of what Jesus Christ has done. And Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, then you can be saved from shame. He says it here, and Jesus is Lord is what we say with our mouths. And this has power because in order to, to give our shame away, in order to hand it over to Jesus, we need to say that he has the authority to do it, okay? He needs to be someone who, who can do this, right? If, if, I don't know, Mark comes up to me and says, John, I think I can take your shame away, just, you know. I'll be like, Mark, no, like, you don't have that kind of authority. Um, if Mark were to die, for me, it wouldn't do anything. He's not Lord. It doesn't work. But Jesus is Lord. He has the kind of authority to look at you and say, I have taken what you have done. I have taken what you have said and thought, and I have dealt with it. And when we say Jesus is Lord, it's not just that he has the authority to deal with this stuff once and for all. It's also that it reorientates us. Because Shame, there's that existential shame, right? The stuff that, that no one knows about. But there's also, isn't there, this kind of social shame that we feel of, of kind of trying to impress people or, or being afraid of being excluded or, or hiding things away from other people. And that comes from the audience, right? Some audiences we are particularly wary of. There are some things that I'm relaxed. There are some people um, that I'm very relaxed about knowing about certain stuff. And some people I'll be like, oh, I don't want them to find out about that. Um, so um, trying to think of an example, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, um, my, I, I, would, I would not swear in front of my parents, but I would swear in front of my friends at school. You know? That kind of different audience type thing, very trivial example. With Jesus as Lord, we are able to perform and to live and to flourish with this audience of one. Yeah? We don't have to worry about what people are thinking. Yeah, people matter. And we, we don't want to offend them or hurt them. We need to be aware that we, we're not idiots. But fundamentally, I am not to be controlled by what someone else thinks of me. Because I live for an audience of one. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He has died for me. He has taken my shame. And so I can be free. I can live in the freedom of that, of that, that love, that unconditional affirmation of Jesus. Confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord is a public thing. And public allegiance to Christ 
can lead to shame, right? It can be seen as a shameful thing to be a Christian. A bit embarrassing or, or bigoted, I don't know. Actually, I think there's a lot less of that than we sometimes think. But even if it is, like, who cares? <laughs> Isn't the affirmation of Jesus Christ worth more than that? And we, we mustn't be going out looking to, to cause fights or be, be troublesome or, or wind people up or, or hurt people. But fundamentally, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. And when we confess Jesus as Lord publicly, when we have his, him as our primary allegiance, that there might be times, there will be times of difficulty. But it's worth it. Um, and the second thing is, you know, confess through your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's how we're kind of safe from our shame. Also, believing that God raised him from the dead. In verse um, 9 again, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the promise of new life. Shame says you can never start again. You're damaged goods. There's no hope for you. But the resurrection is new life now, and it's the promise of new life to come. Our new life in Christ, it sets us free from shame. It's a new start. Every morning we wake up, and it's a new day, and it's a new start. And whatever thing you've done or said that you're ashamed of, actually there's the opportunity to start with a blank page and, and, and fresh hope. So I've spent a long time on that, but it's important. Um, where, um, where Paul goes with this, where he takes this, his main thrust in this chapter is that this means that anyone, anyone can, can be saved. Anyone can know this freedom from shame. The difference between Jews and Gentiles was really important in, um, in those times. Paul was a Jew, and as I said before, um, he made it his kind of life work to, um, to, to welcome Gentiles into the family of Christianity. So, in those days, um, Jewish people were very exclusive. It was very difficult to um, eat with them if you weren't a Jew. Um, they, they were convinced that God would only work through them. And the first Christians were also Jews, and they shared those kind of attitudes. You know, Jewish people are the only people that God really works through. And Paul's life work was to bring Gentiles in, as I said. And that led to people wanting to kill him. Jewish people were like, this is not all right. We're going to hunt you down. There were even like a bunch of 40 people who said, we're not going to eat until we've killed you. They didn't say that to his face, because that would make it harder to kill him. But they kind of said it, and they tried to kill him. Um, and Paul, in this letter, 16 chapters, is making repeatedly the argument that, that this, hope, this hope is not on the basis of ethnicity or culture, and certainly not on the basis of performance. He says in verse um, 12, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who believes on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Lord blesses all who call on him, everyone. So, so here this morning, no matter what your background is, your story, your ethnicity, your gender, your sexuality, your, your frame of mind, your socioeconomic background, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what shame you've had. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how dirty you feel or how how happy you are. Jesus' welcome is enormous. It's bigger than anything we can imagine. The worst person you can think of, confessing with their mouth, believing in their heart, they can be changed. They can know Jesus Christ. And we are to have that same kind of radical welcome here. That should be reflected in us. There should be no one coming through our door who feels like, they're too dirty, or they're not good enough, or they're the wrong kind of person. That makes no sense. That's not who we are. We need to have a radical welcome that reflects the radical welcome of Jesus Christ. The point that Paul is making is that this is not a hard thing. We don't have to strive to get this freedom. It's not just for some people who are particularly fortunate to be born in the right place or time. No, it's, it's near to us. This gospel word is near. Confess, believe. And it's for anyone. 
And then in verse 14 and 15, um, he lands by saying, look, we need to do something about this. He said, basically, this is quite easy. People just need to believe on the name and they'll be saved. They can know this amazing freedom. And then he says, in verse 14, having just said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. And then he says, how can they call on the one they haven't believed in? That makes sense, right? If you don't believe that God exists or that Jesus is real, you can't call on him. You can't say Jesus is Lord if you think Jesus doesn't exist. Um, and how can they believe in the one of whom they haven't heard? Again, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It's difficult to believe in someone you haven't heard of. Um, pretty sensible. And then how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Now, this might seem a little less obvious, um, because I can think of ways of hearing things without preaching. Like reading, listening to a podcast, it's not a preach. Um, there's all sorts of things, aren't there? Watching TV, I'm not going to list all the ways you can get information. Um, so what does this mean? Well, there's something, something about preaching that's different. The word here is like the word for announcement or proclamation. It's not so much that it's got to be, you know, 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. It's that there's something about hearing truth said as truth, not as interesting ideas or good advice or things to think about, but the, just the simple, straightforward, <laughs> this is the way it is. Jesus came, he died, he rose again, and there's life in him. You know, that, that, that's what preaching is. It's saying there's, something's happened. And it's got implications for the way that we live. There's hope here. And there's a challenge as well. And that happens here. When we gather together and declare who Jesus is and what he's done. And it's a special thing to do together. And it's really important. It's why we spend a good chunk of our time on a Sunday morning to do this. But a similar thing happens actually. When Christians, just on their own, in the workplace, with their mates with their friends, with their, that's the same thing as mate, uh, you know, whoever, people they've just met on the street, I don't know. When Christians, just to say how it is, I find it very easy to caveat what I say about Jesus with people who don't know him by saying, this is what I think, or like, I believe. And that's, you know, that's true, isn't it? I do believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But it lands differently if you just say, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's slightly less, it's more proclaiming, just a different flavor. I'm not saying that I do this, actually. I find it because it's quite ingrained in me um, to, to say that, you know, to caveat it almost, like I believe or I think this or this is what the Bible says. But there's something quite nice, actually, in just putting it out there. <laughs> you know, how does it land? <laughs> And it will land differently. Jesus rose from the dead. Oh, like what? Because, of course, we know that lots of people don't believe that. But if we present it as just as news, this kind of thing needs to be, to be backed up by our lives. And actually, some of the most powerful kind of proclamation is that kind of life storytelling. Just... This is what happened to me. And the gospel is huge. It's enormous. Maybe your experience of the gospel is particularly orientated around freedom from shame. Maybe it's, maybe it's less about that. Maybe it's freedom from the slavery of addiction. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's a kind of powerful sense of new life from spiritual death. But tell the story as news. This happened to me. You can be straightforward about it. You don't have to dress it up. And there's a freedom in that, just saying it how it is. Um, and in verse 15, it says, how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Preaching needs people to be sent. And there's a sense in which I'm preaching here this morning because I've been sent here um, 
by the church, by us. I'm, I'm pastor here because, uh, because the church has recognized me as pastor. And I'm preaching, not off my own authority, but because I've been sent by God. And that's a, that's a terrifying thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a big ask. I'm not here because I'm a particularly special person. I'm just here because that's what God decided. And that's true of all of us. We are all sent, actually. Where you are now, you were sent here. One of the things I quite like saying is my whole life has been leading up to this moment. I like saying it at trivial moments. Like I'll be sitting down for breakfast and I'll be like, my whole life's been leading up to this moment. You know, it's true. My whole life has led up to that breakfast. Wow. You know. um, and you can apply that to any point in your life. You, your whole life has been leading up to this moment now. Um, and it's true. And it's really powerful, actually. Because it's not just your whole life has been leading up to, you, to this moment, but actually God has been leading you to this moment. So tomorrow, wherever you are tomorrow, think about where you'll be tomorrow at nine minutes past 12. Um, and, um, <laughs> and, and, and you will be sent there. And what difference does it make if you're sent? Well, it means you're sent partly to preach, right? And that doesn't mean getting up on your soapbox, standing on your chair and saying, Jesus is Lord, repent and believe. It means just being who you are. It means owning the fact that you are there because you are sent. And it means telling it like it is. Jesus is Lord. He is rising from the dead. And that is amazing. That frees us from shame. It, it brings us into new life. So um, I'll pray now and, and then we'll carry on. Father God, thank you for your, um, your goodness. Thank you so much that Jesus Christ is good news for us. Thank you that uh, relationship with him changes us. Thank you that we can know freedom from shame, that we can know freedom from sin. And Lord, help us to see that. Help us to take it and own it and proclaim it, Lord. Uh, give us freedom and give us confidence and give us hope um, in the name of Jesus Christ. The, uh, the band are going to uh, come back up. Um, yeah, it's so, so great, isn't it, to hear just a couple of those, couple of those challenges. And we're going to spend a bit of time just, um, just in the quiet of our, our hearts, quite in the room, just to uh, reflect on, on what's just been said. The three, three key things on that. We are saved if we proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and someone is saying, that isn't you. You're here and that isn't something that has happened in your life. You, you like that thing. Um, we've got a prayer team at the back over in that corner who would love to pray with you if they, uh, yeah, that's been kind of stirred and, or put on your heart. Um, but also that, that feeling of maybe you feel really excluded. The gospel is for anyone, it's for everyone, regardless of what shame you, you carry with you. The gospel is good news, irrespective of the, the shame and guilt we carry. And then that, that final one to be sent. 13 minutes past 12, 10 minutes past 12, tomorrow we're going to be sent somewhere. And our whole lives have been leading to that. Maybe there's a sense of you need to space pray with someone to, to I suppose, reorientate your context, your workplace, your mates, your family, the time you spend in, in those places that God has sent you, placed you to, to go and to preach, to claim the good news of Jesus, to be yourself, to be Christ in that place. Um, so if any of those things are, have struck you or challenged you, you want to pray with anyone, please head, head to the back during the next couple of songs. Um, but yeah. We're going to uh, we're going to stand uh, and we're going to sing together. We're going to sing a song called um, "Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me," and and actually that's a great song to sing in response to that because it's it's not in our own strength that we go, but it's in His strength. It's not in our own works that we're saved, but it's in His power. Um, so yeah, let's let's sing that together. <laughs> Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to fear. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. 
Sure, sure, the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin has been defeated. Jesus is now.
message that the transforming message that Jesus died on the cross and we can stand here as your people and we can say hallelujah praise the one who set us free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me we praise you that you broke the chains of our of our shame Lord you broke the chains of our, of our guilt Lord and it's not through anything that we can do in our own works Lord but it's through totally through your power and what you achieved for us on the cross and so Lord we as a church declare that Jesus is Lord, Lord, and we want to be a people who go into our context, into our workplace, into our families, into our, our friendships, Lord, and declare that. And we want to see, Lord, this city change. We want to see friendships change. We want to see relationships change as a result of that news going out into this place. And so, Lord, we praise you this morning for, yeah, how you've been stirring our hearts, Lord, and speaking to us. And we praise you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, please do have a seat. That's the uh, that's the end of our our formal time together. Um, just an encouragement that the prayer team is is still available at the back. Um, I really feel like the Lord's doing something this morning in, in lots of our hearts um, as John has kind of preached to us. Um, and so yeah, pr- please don't leave here. If if the Lord has stirred you in any way, please use the prayer team. They'd love to pray with you in confidence, but also pray with the person you came with or people around you. Um, that's such a yeah, such a good thing to do. Um, and as we as we go, as we kind of draw our time uh, to a close, let me just read um, yeah, from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. May that be your prayer. May that be truth as you go into this week. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, great to have you with us this morning at church. Um, yeah, have a great week. And Please do stick around, carry on those conversations you were having earlier on as well uh, over tea and coffee uh, in the other room. Uh, but yeah, when you have to go, have a great week and we'll, we'll see you this time next week as well.